Hello, my name is Colin Carter of Aurora Consulting and before I set up Aurora Consulting in 2002 I had previously been a co-founder of Kennedy Carter back in 1988 and I want to talk to you today about uh, our experience of bridging between domains and the uh, way that we did that both in the time at Aurora and at Kennedy Carter. At last year's uh, XTUML conference, we did discuss the idea of formalizing uh, the best practice in XUML modeling at the moment, so called OOA20, and the intercommunication between domains needs to be a key part of that. Currently, there are different approaches used by, for example, the Bridgepoint and the uh, IUML communities, and we need a, a more common approach uh, to, to go forward, really. This talk uh, is based on the approach that we used in, uh, it was developed in Kennedy Carter and supported largely by the IUML tool and adopted by many of the tool users. The focus, however, is on the principles of bridging between domains rather than any specific tool specific uh, support. So let me now just uh, share my presentation with you. and set myself up a bit, uh, a bit better here. Um, so, I want to exploit the idea of, of domains and their separation of concerns, but at the same time, achieve intercommunication inter between those domains, uh, because it's key that um, in, a, in a proper working system, uh, sets of domains need to work together. So the concept of domains and uh, intercommunication between them through bridges has been in, in Schleimella since the very early days. It was introduced in Object Life Cycles book, uh, Modeling the World in States by St Sally and Steve. However, uh, that didn't go into a great deal of detail as to how uh, you would uh, make those bridges. And therefore there has never been a common part of the formalism that describes that. Uh, this talk will describe how um, we understood domains and bridges and uh, used uh, the ideas of maintaining separation of concerns to develop those ideas and support them in, in IUML. And we'd like to uh, pr propose that there's some candidate thoughts here for the OA20 um, work that's, that's hopefully going to carry on. So let's start with the, the good old definition. Um, uh, that Sally and Steve came up with. A domain is a separate, real, hypothetical or abstract world inhabited by a distinct set of classes that behave according to the rules and policies characteristic of a domain. I'm sure uh, most of you remember that one. The important thing about a domain is it supports this idea of separation of concerns. They are the separate worlds uh, part of that uh, definition is a really key one. Um, Ideally, we want to maintain that separation as much as possible to minimize the coupling between them. The benefit of doing that is that we reduce the impact of change. Changing one domain uh, will uh, have hopefully little impact on other domains. And it also enhances the opportunity of re reusing domains in other contexts because we've, we've isolated the sub subject matters effectively. However, we can't uh, build systems out of single domains. Generally, typical systems are described by sets of interacting domains. A user story or a system lifecycle will usually in involve the interaction of multiple domains. So how can we have them interact without increasing the coupling between them? We want to retain the idea of a domain as an encapsulated thing with its subject matter encapsulated and protected but we will choose to formalize the interfaces those domains offer and need using the UML terminology of provided interface, the set of services that a, that a domain will make available to others and required interface, the set of services that the domain will need from others. Another key thing we're going to look at is the idea that a class in one domain will have a counterpart in another domain. 
and that goes down to the instance level. So an instance of a class in one domain will have a corresponding and linked instance of a class in another domain. So how do we achieve that? So we'll look at that in a bit of detail too. So let's start with an example, a simple example. Here's a, a simplified banking domain with uh, classes like customer and account. Um, and at the bottom you see a collaboration diagram showing one particular uh, use case, if you like, of uh, deleting the account. So when we want to delete the account, we have to look to see if that's the last account of that customer. And if, if it is the last account, we want to delete the customer as well. Uh, but we also want to keep a record of the fact that we've closed the account. Uh, and we've chosen in this domain to delegate that responsibility to some other domain. We're going to place that requirement to record the account closure as, as represented down here on some other domain. As yet, we don't know what domain that will be, but we are not going to do it in this domain. So representing that on our domain chart, we would have our, our package in UML representing our, our banking domain and the dependency to an as yet unidentified server domain that will be the thing that provides the service uh, suitable for recording account closure. So um, the server domain, the one that's going to provide that service uh, is an encapsulated domain and here is uh, the, the package logging here will be represented internally by its class diagram and all its dynamic behavior. Um, but it's encapsulated and the only services that are available to outside users of that domain are through its provided interface. And in this trivial uh, example here, we've made that a single operation. I'll come back to whether uh, operations or signals can go through provided interfaces and on, on what's appropriate for providing required interfaces. We'll look at that a bit later on. So this is a domain that is making available a single provided interface and a single operation to log an item through that provided interface. So we could use that service directly. Um, we could have our banking domain uh, depend upon, make a call to the service offered by the provided interface, log item, and the logging domain would realize that behavior. So if we were to do that, then we'd have to tweak our domain, uh, our client domain here, the banking domain. And here's our banking collaboration diagram. And now we're being explicit about the idea of logging an item and using the provided interface of logging client. So within our banking domain, we now have explicit knowledge of the service we're going to use and the, and, uh, the interface on the domain that we're going to use. Uh, to support that need for recording account closure. Also notice we have changed our subject matter reference. Here we're talking about logging item, whereas what we wanted to talk about was record account closure. However, this is possible and it would be represented uh, using the provide interface diagram like this, which is, it is straightforward and simple. Now this idea of coupled domains, as I've called them coupled domains, this works, it's very common, um, but the client domain has explicit knowledge of the server domain. And it's unlikely that that will be in a single place. It's very common that there will be multiple uses of the services of a provided interface by the client domain. And therefore, knowledge of the client domain will be spread throughout the, um, uh, knowledge of the server domain will be spread throughout the client domain. And we've undermined our idea of keeping the world separate. We have now polluted knowledge of one domain into another. So can we do any better than that? Right, so here's a idea of a required interface. Again, it's a UML concept, um, and it defines the operations that a domain expects others to provide on its behalf. This is frequently overlooked, not just in executable UML, but in, in all uses of UML. And it's valuable because it makes the dependencies that domain has on other domains completely explicit. It's the job of the required interface in the terminology of the requiring domain to make explicit the requirements that it has on other domains. So what might a um, 
her required interface look like. So here we've got our same old banking domain again, and here we are including explicitly uh, um, a, an interface which we've called historic record. It's stereotyped with required interface, and it provides the service we call account closure. The banking domain is not responsible for implementing or realizing the record account closure operation. Something else will do that for it. A domain can have zero or more required interfaces. Uh, each required interface can have uh, one or more operations. And a required interface is not realized by the domain that requires it. And being an interface class, it doesn't have any attributes. And as Wills and D'Souza said, in domain based design, it is essential to document what is required of domains uh, that you may connect to and whose implementation you know nothing about. So if we were just to represent that uh, on a domain chart, we now know that our logging domain is going to be capable of uh, supporting the requirement of our banking domain. And we've got a simple dependency, the, the, the bridge arrow, um, uh, but it doesn't tell us how that um, logging domain is going to support the needs of the banking domain. The benefit of this is that uh, we can now put our um, client domain back into purely into the knowledge of the client domain uh, subject matter area. So down at the bottom here, our record account closure operation is returned and we are, uh, have a required interface on, uh, for a historic record. So the terminology throughout this domain can now be in the subject matter of the client domain, banking in this case, and we do not need to include any knowledge of the capability of any server domains that might support it. Provided interfaces um, have a lot of the same characteristics as uh, required interfaces. You can have zero or more of them on a domain. Each domain can have one or more operations. Again, I'll come back to operations versus signals, but to keep it simple for now, let's just treat it as operations. Uh, and a provided interface is realized by the domain that provides it. And again, it being an interface, it doesn't have any attributes. So probably the most important slide in the whole set is this one. So here we've got our banking domain and its required interface historic record, which says that the banking domain needs somebody else to fulfill the record account closure service for it. Down here, we've got our logging domain and uh, it's got a provider interface which will take log item. And the way that we join these two together is with a bridge class. Here it's this class stereotyped bridge and it is the thing that realizes the required interface. Simple as that, the job of the bridge class is to realize this, the services offered in the required interface. So in here we will have the implementation of record account closure, it can be specified in an action language, uh, but it's only there that we have explicit knowledge of the domains that we're making use of the provided interfaces of the domains that we're making use of. So we've isolated the knowledge of the two domains. Each domain only knows about itself and its own subject matter area. And the job of mapping between those two ideas is done in the bridge class as shown here in this trivial one operation example. Um, in general, a bridge class can uh, support multiple operations in a required interface uh, and it can make use of multiple provided interfaces from multiple other domains, server domains. It does not need to be um, a one-to-one -one, as is shown here. This is just to keep, show a simple example. So the bridge class realizes a single required interface. It can therefore realize multiple operations for that required interface. And as I've said, each of, one of, each of those will depend upon one or more server domains and with one or more provided interfaces in them. Now, this is a pattern that's been around uh, in, in other communities, either called the adapter or the wrapper. The benefit of using a bridge like this is that it allows us to minimize the coupling between domain, domains. The client domain has no knowledge of anything about the server domain. There is no pollution of subject matter. Now, hopefully this is gonna reduce our impact of change. If we have to change something in our server domain, uh, 
and the provider interface has to change in some way, then the impact on the client domain hopefully will be minimized to the changes we can make in the bridge to remap. If the uh, provided interface changes in such a way that that domain no longer provides what we need, then obviously the impact of change is bigger. Um, but it will, in general, reduce the impact of change rippling through into client domains. And the other great benefit is that the required service and the provided service that, uh, uh, that we're trying to match here don't need to match exactly. They can match exactly in terms of their capability, but as long as the provided service exceeds what is required, then we should be able to map them together. So the provided service, people did a lot more than we need, but as long as it does what we need, then it's a suitable mapping. Now, just to uh, reflect on the tool specific terminology briefly, uh, in IUML, the provided interface was primarily the domain operations, but there was also the, uh, the idea in the OA97 paper, which I'll come back to, that um, you could invoke services on of published instance services using where well, we use counterparts, but I'll come back to counterparts. And the required interface uh, in IUML was called the terminator. And you could have multiple terminators per domain and multiple uh, operations within the terminator. In Bridgepoint, the idea provided interface and required interface, as I understand it, is supported, uh, but it's slightly different to the way that I've used them here. Uh, so a provided interface could be either the to provider on a provided interface or the from provider on a required interface or uh, a required interface is the from provider on a provided interface or the to provider on a required interface. And if I've got that wrong, I'm sure there's somebody um, who will, who will uh, put that right in the questions and answers at the end. The other topic I want to look at was the idea of counterparts. So let's take this little example here. We've got three different subject matters in three different colors. So here we've got a, a customer renting something, a customer item for rent and the rental. Here we've got an insurer um, providing insurance uh, to insure something. And over here we've got something that um, needs to be serviced from time to time and has a service capability. Different subject matters, we'd like to keep those as clean uh, and um, specialized to their jobs as possible and don't want certainly don't want knowledge of how we service the items that need to be rented for example however if we take uh, a, an example like managing a hire car fleet then uh, one of the things that we'd like to be able to do is to delegate as much of the responsibility for managing the hire car fleet as possible to other domains that can provide useful services so for example a big function in the managed hire car fleet will be managing rentals. But if we have a generic rentals domain that can do that for us, we would make use of it. Similarly, the, the business of insuring items and having policies and insurers and renewals and all that kind of stuff is a subject matter that we want to keep separate in another domain. Also servicing items. And one I didn't mention in that first example, asset management, we've got things of considerable value here that will depreciate over time. And in any good business, we want to manage that depreciation, manage the values of our assets so that we can keep our company accounts straight. So how might we use these domains together to achieve our overall objective? Well, we can take uh, a simple example here of the hire car class that exists in the managed hire car fleet. And that would be something that we would have a corresponding abstraction of in our rentals domain called the item for rent. And it would also correspond to something called insured item in our insurance domain. And the hire car would also correspond to serviceable item in our servicing domain, and it would also be an asset. So this is an example of um, counterparting. Here's a class which has a corresponding class in another domain. The abstractions in each of those domains are purely relevant to the domains that they're in. But we want to maintain knowledge, even at the instance level, that an instance of a hire car is also an instance of an item for rent and an instance of a short, insured item and so on. So these are just like associations as we've, as we've used within domains, but these are now counterpart relationships. So 
The model in each domain makes sense in its own right. It describes the subject matter of the domain. A class in one domain can correspond to a class in another domain and it's known as a counterpart. The important thing is here that one real world thing can be an instance of each of these classes. We don't try and, in our model, we don't try and bring them together. Perhaps in your implementation, you merge them all together so that they are um, a, a single implementation. But if we do that by code generation, it doesn't matter. In our domains, we want to keep those things separate because they are separate worlds. So an actual hire car is an instance of the hire car class, the insured item class, and so on. One real world thing has multiple different abstractions. So we use things called counterpart relationships, which um, are very much like associations in uh, normal domain models to maintain the links between those instances. Um, they're slightly different to uh, standard associations in that they're always one-to-one, -one, although they can be conditional. Conditionality can come about because of timing. We might create something in one domain before we can create it in another. And it might also come about because of generalization, specialization. We can have a specialization. If we have a specialization, it will always have a counterpart generalization instance, but we can have a generalization instance and it's a counterpart is only one of its possible specializations. It can also be normal associations. We call those peer-to-peer -peer associate, peer-to-peer -peer counterpart relationships. The other ones were um, generalization, specialization relationships. So in our example, insured item could be a generalization in the insurance domain, and it could have a counterpart, uh, multiple counterparts in the managed hire car fleet, for example, hire car, which we've already seen, but also other specializations of insured item might be employee and even the hire car office itself. It's a building and we may uh, likely need to insure it. So counterpart uh, relationships can be either generalization, specialization, um, and or they can be normal associations. And when we have specializations, those specializations can be in multiple different domains. Typically, counterpart generalizations are in service domains, which is not a surprise. Um, and the specializations of those could be in multiple domains. Now, the form, the linking, navigating, and unlinking of counterpart relationships only ever happens in a bridge or in the software architecture. I won't go into that here, but there are ways in which the software architecture could provide some of the support directly for us. So for example, if we create a model and using our counterpart relationships, we note that uh, hire car and insured item are counterparts, then when we create hire car explicitly with some action language in our hire car management, our managed hire car fleet domain, the architecture could automatically create an insured item in our insurance domain. I'm not going to go into that in detail here, but it has been, uh, the ideas on that were described in the OA97 paper. So what do bridges have in them? They have action language, as I've already said, uh, and they can be implemented using action language. They don't need any special action language features other than the ability to define the namespace that you're in. Now, an ex uh, a language like Mazel, for example, has the namespace part built into it. So in your, um, to refer to the service domain that you wanted to make use of, the server domain you want to make use of, you would write domain name, colon, operation name to specify wh where the service was being provided and which provider interface it was on. But there's no other special uh, features that are needed. Um, uh, if, you, if you take uh, create linking and unlinking counterpart relationships as normal linking and unlinking type things. The job of the bridge is simply to map from the required to the provided interface. So it should be as thin as possible to do that. There shouldn't be any logic in there at all that belongs in either the client or the server domain. It's purely there to achieve that mapping. So the single arrow on the domain chart may because uh, there might be multiple required interfaces and multiple services in each of those required interface result in multiple bridge interactions. And also they might be in both directions. 
if a client domain makes a request of a server domain and that server domain needs to provide a response sometime later, then that, that response will go back through, through uh, the bridge uh, in the domain chart terms, but we'd have a separate required and provided interface pair to do that. And I think that's somewhere where the work that project uh, that um, Bridgepoint has done um, might be something that we can make adva take advantage of. The fact that they are they are partly grouped together. We'll look a bit more at that uh, in detail at, when we look at contracts. So typical bridge operation contents. They can be calls to operations on the provided interface. Uh, typically class-based operations, um, uh, including creation of counterparts, um, or there can be instance-based operations where we have a counterpart relationship. And therefore we can use the counterpart relationship to identify the instance uh, in the other domain and therefore invoke an instance-based operation on that. We also need to typically map parameters the parameters may well be in uh, one type space for one domain and a different type space for another domain. We might have to map uh, between them. Um, and we may have to pack parameters uh, into suitable structures that the provider interface needs. And we may also finally need to link, navigate and unlink counterpart relationships. The link, navigate and unlink commands are the same as they are within a domain, just that we're manipulating counterpart relationships instead of standard associations. So let's go back to the events idea. Um, can we send events across a bridge? Can I generate an event in one domain and direct it at an instance in another domain? Uh, so what would the bridge have to say about that? I think that sums it up nicely. Uh, the client domain doesn't have any visibility of the instances of the server domain. Also, it doesn't know about the events that the server domain can respond to because they're separate worlds. So an event generated in the client domain cannot directly cross the bridge. So a required interface can receive a bridge service invocation. I've called it operations in our several examples so far, but could that be, um, uh, could we, map an event in some way through a bridge. And in fact, the invocation on, of the service uh, in the required interface doesn't need to specify whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. We're not going to deal with it differently on the required side. The invocation parameters that we provide on that required interface must include sufficient data to allow us to map to the class instance in the server domain if we are, want to send an event across that bridge. So the bridge could map the invocation, which needn't be an event. It could just be a, an invocation, a call, um, to unspecified whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. Um, map that invocation to an event in the server domain. Obtain the destination instance, preferably by navigating a counterpart relationship, but you might need to use a find if you haven't done that before. Uh, map any other events, uh, parameters that it, there are and generate the new event to be placed on the event queue in the server domain. The bridge mapping would be executed in the same thread of control as the original invocation, in other words, out of the client domain, um, uh, but the event is queued after the bridge in the received domain. So we don't need to queue, queue events uh, in the requesting domain. Now, uh, I wanted to try and avoid contracts, but I don't think I can. So just a brief slide. <clears throat> Interactions across bridges often come in groups. They don't, uh, they can be single things, but it's quite common that there are groups of them. And it's quite useful to capture these groups of interactions. And one way of doing that is the notion of contracts, which was introduced by Bertrand Mayer uh, in his book on Eiffel. And there are three basic types of contracts, although you can embellish these for extra effect. One is an open contract. The sender does not require any response. And our invocation of log item is a good example of that. As long as the thing logs the item, we don't need to know anything uh, other than be confident that it's happened. Uh, 
You can have a closed blocking contract, so the sender does require a response and is prepared to wait for it. So the server domain will go off and do its job whilst the client domain hangs and waits for that re response to come back. Or a closed non-blocking contract. The sender does require a response but isn't prepared to wait for it, is going to go off and do other things, service other events within its domain while it's waiting and it will expect the response to be provided asynchronously sometime later. Contracts can be defined on both required and provided interfaces. The great thing is they don't need to match. An open contract on the required interface can map to a closed blocking contract on a provided interface, for example. There's lots of other combinations that, that uh, can be considered and supported. But it's worth bringing in the idea of contracts here because if we think about the interactions across bridges, it's really important not to think about them uh, as individual, um, individual services. They come in groups and maintaining them in groups and knowledge of them in groups is really helpful to our uh, integration efforts. Where do bridges live? Well, the first thing is they don't live with either of the domains that uh, they map between. Um, so they have to map, live outside. Now, uh, unless we include this in the formalism, it's currently a tool support issue. IUML um, had the idea of a project. Um, both domains and projects were versioned. And a project conversion, a project version, contained a defined set of domain versions and the bridges required to interconnect them didn't have to have all the bridges you needed, you could just have a subset. And what we see, what we saw, our, the way that we implemented it was that bridges evolve with the development of the domain. So they can start out as a stub. Now that stub can belong, really does belong to the domain that's, um, that, that uh, is the requiring interface side. Because what that's saying is, um, I'm gonna just get a return back so that I can carry on doing what I, what I need to do to make my domain so I can test my domain standalone. So there's no, there's no knowledge in the stub that is knowledge of any other domains. It's purely local to the requesting domain. The next sort of step might be the idea of a, of a mock where you do the basics to um, illustrate the domain um, interaction, but it doesn't really do a lot of useful stuff. So it might allow you to, if you've got a, uh, a use case that interacts with three or four domains, you could mock through the behavior of the domains just to show that you've got connection between the domains. And then you can build up your interactions with early versions of real domains and full versions in, over time. And also uh, you don't need to uh, use a fully fledged domain to provide a service. You could use software components that are developed outside of XTML, just code, code modules, code components, that you want to make use of. So you can mix uh, an XTUML environment with a non-XTUML environment using bridges in this way. So this um, idea of evolving the bridge implementation maps directly to the, the sort of agile working and this was introduced uh, well before agile's time. So in summary, bridges were part of the original Schlemmeler vision, the idea of uh, integrating um, domains together, but maintaining them as separate uh, worlds. Um, we've been using bridges like this for a uh, considerable time, and we know they are valuable, and they do achieve that separation of concerns and maintaining the separation of concerns. It would be great to see the formalism support them officially uh, with, with uh, an OA20 update. It is important to remember that direct coupling of domains should still be allowed as an alternative to building decoupled bridges as we've got here, because uh, as long as you can accept the need for increased coupling and hence fragility, they do work um, and there's, uh, there's slightly less work to do, to do to build them that way. If we have support for both direct and indirect coupling, then users have the power uh, of domains and separation of concerns, and they have the power of bridges uh, and the flexibility to use them when they need them. This has uh, only been a short introduction and lots of other aspects need to be considered um, when we are going, to, if we're going to build up the OA20 formalism, much more needs to be go, thought about on contracts, the ideas of architecture support for counterparting and how far that wants to go, uh, 
and I certainly recommend using the um, OOA, uh, KC OOA 97 document as the basis for the formalization of OOA 20. So let me just stop the share. <coughs> um, and in the time I've had available, it's not been possible to go into all the details, but hopefully this has given you a flavor of the approach to interdomain communication that uh, we have adopted. Uh, as I've mentioned, this approach was underpinned by the OA97 document, which is freely available, and we'll make sure that uh, links to that are available in the, in the um, conference materials. Uh, and it's certainly a very good agenda for the things that need to be thought about. It's ASL specific, so it's not gonna be an out of the box thing, but it's certainly a useful thing to uh, use as the basis for considering uh, all that needs to go into the formalization of bridges. I'm still hanging around for questions now, so uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>